Thank you very much. This has been a wonderful conference. It's been a very much a pleasure to attend. I've learned so much from all the speakers that have contributed in the last two days. Today we're going to talk about where does pain come from and how do we make it go away. I would like to suggest that less than the pain treatments that we were taught may work less than 10% of the time. If you take a migraine medicine, it makes this migraine go away, but the migraines come back. So maybe it really doesn't work. And the model and paradigm that we use to treat and think about pain is probably not the reality of our biology, and we'll talk about that in just a couple minutes. The person on the left is my New York son, and he's the reason I have an office in Manhattan, and the one on the right is my Seattle son, and he is the reason I have an office in Seattle. But our main base is in Cincinnati, Ohio. We know that sometimes what we do requires the nerve to do things a little bit differently and my practice has not been any different than your practices as we nudge the, the far end of the field or we nudge what we have all been taught to accept as true and find out that it's really not and we need to do things a different way. What would you do if your finger was bleeding? Do you hold your finger up in the air, watch the blood drain down your arm, and um, wait till morning? Do you take some ibuprofen, wait till morning and see what happens? Do you run to the emergency room? Uh, because it's a tragedy and you need to stop the blood or you just put your finger on the bleeding and, and stop it directly. That's an easy one. What happens if your back hurts? It's the day after you lifted all the mulch. Do you run to the emergency room because it hurts so bad? Do you take some Advil and wait till morning? Do you, or perhaps you could take your finger and put it on the source of the pain and shut down the pain as easily and as well as you could stop the bleeding. And they really aren't that much different. The model that's taught around the world about chronic pain is that we start with an acute injury, we have acute pain from that, and if that pain isn't gone in three to six months, it magically turns into chronic pain, and then there's no hope for recovery. You have to kill the nerve, interrupt the signal, use epidural steroids, or make the nervous system not work with medications and TENS units. And that's what we're taught about pain. But the reality of what we do is that acute injury does lead to acute pain, and our, but our biology will continue to experience some evolution of that pain until we heal the injuries that initially caused it. And then as fast as you can get those injuries to heal, the pain will go away. That is the reality of what really works in pain. And so rather than perpetuating the pain and rather than helping, helping people just cope and, and endure with the pain, you can actually heal the injuries, find the injuries, and make it go away. Well, this has been quite an experience. It's actually, I'm actually a little bit in shock. I've dealt with back issues almost my entire life, starting with scoliosis. And I thought that pain was something I was just going to have to live with. And so now that I have issues with my shoulder, it's gotten so much worse, I thought I have to try something different. And now that I saw Dr. Blattman, I'm quite in shock. I've learned that pain is not what I thought it was, and the way you treat it, is not the way that I've been treating it. So now I'm excited because now I'm, I can't wait to see how much better my body's going to get. So this leads us to the four rules of CSI for pain. When a patient comes to me, they're asking, where does my pain come from? And how do we figure it out? And how do we make it go away? Well, I put this together into four rules, the Blattman four rules of CSI for pain. Rule number one, is you can't believe that the pain comes from where you feel it. Your headache doesn't come from your head. The pain in your left arm could be a heart attack. Your knee pain probably doesn't come from your knee. Why would you think your low back pain that you've treated for all these years really comes from your lower back? Rule number two, you can't believe what you think the pain feels like. We spend a lot of time discerning the difference between numbness, tingling, burning, where is it sharp, where is it dull, where is it achy, and truth be told, the part of our nervous system that differentiates that pain can't. And so there's really no difference between numbness, tingling, burning, itch, tickle, sharp, dull, achy. None of those words are diagnostic. So if you can't believe where you feel it and you can't believe what it feels like, rule number three is what you can believe. And as we examine your body millimeter by millimeter, 
The places where you are specifically tender are either where your fascia is pulled and injured or where your fascia is tied in a knot, compressing the nerve endings in between the strings. Rule number four, the areas that are specifically most tender as you examine your body that way usually generate most of the pain of which you are conscious. And rule number five is the rule of treatment. When we go to play CSI, a patient comes into my office and they want to know where does their pain come from and they want to get it treated. So the Blattman rules of CSI for pain, how do you figure out who did it? Rule number one, you can't believe that the pain comes from where you feel it. Your headache does not come from your head. Your lower back pain may not come from your lower back. Your knee pain does not come from your knee, except sometimes. Your left arm pain could be your heart attack. You have no idea. You just know the left arm hurts. Rule number two, how much time do we spend teasing out the nuances of what do you think the pain feels like? Where does it burn? Where is it sharp? Where is it achy? Where is it numb? Where is it tingling? Truth be told, the nervous system, the part of the nervous system that transmits this pain cannot tell the difference between numbness, tingling, burning, itch, tickle, sharp, dull, achy. None of it matters, and none of it is diagnostic. The location and distribution of those sensations is absolutely important, but the way your brain interprets those sensations has almost nothing to do with its origin. Rule number three, if you can't believe where you hurt and you can't believe what it feels like, rule number three is what you can believe. You can totally believe that when we, me and you, examine your body together, millimeter by millimeter, the places where you are tender are either where your fascia is torn from where it attaches and holds on to you, or where it's twisted into a knot, squishing the nerve endings in between the strings that generate all those sensations. You can totally believe that. Rule number four, what we found is that the places that are most tender when we examine you that way generate most of the pain that you are conscious of. And rule number five is the rule of treatment. When we get the sites of injury to heal, most of the pain that you thought you had will go away as fast as you can make that happen. And these injuries can't be seen on an x-ray or an MRI. These injuries need to be palpated. So how is our body held together? How is it injured? And how does it repair? And that brings us to fascia. And one of the newest books is written by a friend of mine, David Lasondak. He took the video that we're about to see and Tom Myers did the anatomy trains. Is anybody familiar with that? Some of you are. So we are one piece of string from our head to our toe, and we're about to see a video live dissection of the posterior back line, superficial back line. But look at the forms of fascia. In some places, it's really thick. It turns out it could be a ligament. It covers our brain. It covers our intestines. It holds our body together from head to toe. It allows our heart to beat and not fall. It holds our liver in place. It holds our intestines in place. So anatomy trains, you can actually order these videos and show them to your patients, but I want you to see this one. And this is the superficial back line of fascia. Um, take the sound off for this one, please. So there is the heel and the foot up the heel cord. Then comes the gastroc muscle. And you're going to see that the gastrocs and the hamstrings are tied together. You can't separate them. They only tack in and interweave to the periosteum. They do not attach to bone. No tendon in your body really attaches to bone. If the hamstrings are tied together, you can't coordinate them separately. If they're not tied together, your coordination and function can be different. That leads us up to the lower back and the lumbodorsal fascia, the sacrotuberous ligament, the multifidi muscle, we're going to go up the back. This is the cervical muscles. And then the galea over the scalp goes to the forehead. So you are one string from your forehead all the way down your backside under the ball of your feet. If you want to feel that, all you need to do is put a stretch on your hamstring. And then while you've got a stretch on your hamstring, dorsiflex your ankle and you'll feel it get bigger in your hamstring. And then tilt your head and you'll feel it even bigger. And you've just felt the superficial back line. In a similar fashion, we have a deep back line. We have superficial and deep front, side, and spiral lines up the middle that hold us together. How many of you have this pain 
right here in the upper shoulder blade, and you think things attach there. And what I want to show you is that nothing really attaches there. Watch this video. Um, play the sound on this one, please. So I'm holding on to the rhomboids that have been resected from the spinous processes here. You can see the white division between rhomboid minor and rhomboid major, and you see the medial border of the scapula here. And if you if I let go of these rhomboids, you see how they are not really headed for the medial border of the scapula, but really sucked down into the serratus anterior. However, if I use them as a strap and put some tension on them, you see how they move that medial border of the scapula. And if we move the camera down to the ribs below the scapula, you see the serratus anterior being moved. Therefore, that Myers guy tends to talk about the rhomboserratus muscle as if this were one muscular sheet that's going across and the scapula is either down and out if the serratus anterior is locked short and thus the rhomboids would be locked long or if the rhomboids are locked short or concentrically loaded then the medial border of the scapula Isn't that fascinating? The scapula floats in a sea of fascia and is not really attached to any of it. Body work changes fascia. When you get a massage, it's not just relaxation. It's not just working out the toxicity of the muscle. You can actually change the chemical milieu of the muscle. When fibroblasts within a muscle are stressed from repetitive strain injury, from chewing gum, from doing all the kinds of things that you do over and over that you probably shouldn't do so much, you increase the inflammatory chemicals that the fibroblast creates to heal the injury that you've just created. 90 seconds of osteopathic manipulation or myofascial release will actually undo the inflammatory changes caused by an eight hour repetitive strain injury. You're changing the chemistry of the tissue. Fascia also can contract. If I wanna use a voluntary motion, I can ask my hand to go pick up a cup, but fascia has muscle fibers in it. And so when you walk around and your shoulders are up by your neck, it's because your fascia tightened so your muscles don't have to do the work. And fascia, when it tightens, is slow. It takes an hour and a half for it to contract and takes another hour and a half for it to release. And we don't really know what button releases it and we're not quite sure what button causes it to tighten. Sometimes this contraction is pathologic, like in Dupuytren's contracture. And as a hand surgeon, we would make a Z-plasty incision and peel all that fascia away and carve it out. What we do in our office is we take a needle, and a needle has a nice sharp point at the end, but if you use a needle bigger than a 27 gauge, the needle also can be used as a knife because it has a sharp bevel. And so through the skin, you can cut those cords, release the tension on the finger. It doesn't make the cord go away, but you have all your motion restored, and your recovery instead of three weeks in a bandage is have a nice day. Scoliosis also comes from fascia. We think, when we look at these x-rays, that this is a S-curve, but it's not an S-curve, it's a spiral. And what happens in scoliosis is the fascia of this child doesn't grow as the child grows, or it contracts pathologically somehow from an old injury of God knows where. And now the spine can't grow vertically, so it grows in the path of least resistance, which is a spiral. And every child is different, and every scoliosis pattern is different, but you can actually feel the cords that bind the child, and if you can feel them and get a needle into them, you can actually cut them, release them, release the trigger points that hold them, and the child can grow up without the curve if we can get enough of it. And that way, you can avoid some of these surgeries. We were taught about Golgi tendon organs, we were taught about Bassini corpuscles and Ruffini nerve endings. Do you all remember them? They are only 20% of, the, of what we sense that comes to our brain. Most of the sensation and most of the information that comes to our brain, if we look at the tibial nerve, there's three times more sensory fibers than motor fibers. Only 20% are those mechanoreceptors that I just mentioned. 80% are small diameter interstitial muscle and fascia receptors. 90% of them are unmyelinated free nerve endings, some for pain, some for thermo and chemoreception, but the majority of those nerve endings measure pressure and shear force or friction. And that's where proprioception comes from 
And that's where most of the pain in our body that we might interpret as numbness, tingling, burning, comes from also. It's kind of like this. We have a muscle, and I draw a muscle like strings of fascia just as a diagram, and then the nerve endings in between these strings that are measuring that shear force and measuring pressure. And if we put more pressure, more friction, or tie them up into knots, or we eat inflammatory food, or we're exposed to environmental toxicity, that will increase the pressure on these nerve endings and therefore also increases the pain. Pain does not fall down from the sky. How many of you have pain? Most of us. And so, you wake up in the morning with pain you didn't have last night. Where did it come from? You didn't fall out of bed. You didn't get hurt overnight. I'm going to suggest to you that the pain you woke up with this morning came from last night's food. That's a different talk. And the pain you go to bed with at night that you didn't have in the morning came from breakfast or lunch. Fascia is more innervated than muscle. Proprioception and kinesthesia are primarily fascia, not muscle. Fascia is actually the antenna for the brain to understand what its periphery is doing. And muscles do not have memory. Muscles can't remember anything. If a muscle could remember, then you'd be able to walk after your stroke. But fascia remembers every twist and every turn and every ding your body has ever had. And the ones that are most important are the ones that are causing the pain that you walk around with. Trigger points form in muscle and fascia. It also includes ligaments and tendons. Trigger points are always part of a ropey band, and every ropey band has tender attachments, one end or both ends, and that's where the primary injury is. A tender attachment is an injured attachment. A tender tendon is an injured tendon. So we talk about fascia shear. If we pull on this muscle, which is anchored up here on the north side, and we pull down, and there's a slip in the attachment, there's a shear force between the two of these. And that shear force gets a little bigger, and now we have a trigger point that forms. And that trigger point forms a little bigger, and we get fire. We have a ligament the same way. The ligament gets stretched. And then the ligament gets stretched a little more, and the shear force turns that into fiery pain. So we're talking about myofascial pain. The trigger points, or the ends and the enthesis, is where you're injured. Every trigger point in your body generates two pain patterns 24 hours a day, whether you are conscious of it or not. It, one of the pain patterns is localized right to where it is, and the other is distributed somewhere else, and the sensations will be numbness, tingling, burning, itch, tickle, sharp, dull, achy, and you have a rough time discriminating. <clears throat> there is no sensation of pain that cannot come from injury to fascia. Also, as you look at fascia, there are several things that we learned that are also not true, just like in every other profession. For example, there's no such thing as a medial collateral ligament of a knee. There's no such thing as a lateral collateral ligament of a knee. They're artificially dissected. The fibers don't even run in that direction. They're thickenings of the joint capsule. They don't really deserve their own name. But they function as places where our fascia is reinforced that holds us together. Discrete ligaments would be like anterior and posterior cruciate, but the collateral ligaments do not really, the, the dissection to prove them is an artificial dissection. So how many of you have seen the charts from Janet Travell? So let's go through these. As we talk about head and neck pain, the X's in these diagrams, um, as we talk about headache, migraine, tension, and TMJ-related headaches are not really different. We call them different names. We have different characteristics, but they all have the same origin, and the origin is usually in fascia. So if you have trigger points represented by these X's in your sternocleidomastoid muscle, the pain pattern, numbness, tingling, burning, itch, tickle, sharp, dull, achy, comes from there. And the injuries are where you attach, down here and up here. Where did those injuries come from? Well, those injuries came maybe from grade school. You're out in the playground and some kid comes up behind you and pushes you and snaps your head back and tears this little piece of fashion, twists you into a knot in your sternocleidomastoid that you get to carry for the rest of your life until you learn how to make it go away. 
You might be thinking about tooth pain coming from the tooth, and oftentimes it does. But I've seen patients in my office come and say, my endodontist has done four root canals in that quadrant of my mouth and is starting to think the pain's not coming from my teeth. <laughs> the upper shoulders send pain up the back of the neck. And where's the injury? The injuries are where those green circles are. Where does that come from? You are strong enough to pick up your suitcase. You're strong enough to carry your book bag, but where you attach here and where you attach in the middle isn't strong enough to hold you together when you pull that hard. And that fascia slips and twists into the knots that are in your upper traps. I will suggest to you that if your upper traps are really tender and you have issues with them, you're sensitive to dairy all the way to butter. And you'll find out four weeks after you stop it that most of that pain is gone if it applies to you. The odds are probably about 70%. And you also might have an injury where the muscle reaches and touches your clavicle. In a similar fashion, the muscles in the back of your head make this headache. And notice there's a lot of crossover. It's not one muscle. You have an orchestra arranging your pain pattern, an orchestra that came with time. It's not a solo artist. And then the muscles in your forearm. The orthopedic surgeon puts cortisone here. That weakens the tendon. The orthopedic surgeon is taught that he can only put cortisone in that three times because the fourth time that tendon might be so weak it will spontaneously rupture. If the fourth one is a bad idea, why do we think the first one is a good idea? <laughs> I need, if I could, somebody to demonstrate this twitch response on an elbow. Somebody like to come up and... Sure, thank you. Your elbows are okay? This isn't a painful elbow? Well, except for dentistry. Except for dentistry. <laughs> okay. So this is a twitch response. No, it's fun. Yeah, it is fun. And my wife comes home one day from the shiatsu massage therapist and says, Charlie, wants, Charlie asked me, how come your husband doesn't do this to you? He knows what he's doing. And I told him, because your hands are too tired at the end of the day. And Charlie said, well, why are his hands tired? And my wife says, from pushing on people's trigger points and making them twitch all day. And Charlie says, why does he have to push on them? Can't he just sense that they're there? And I thought, if Charlie can do it, I could do it. And I didn't get it right away, but I will share this pearl. The lighter your touch when you examine another human or an animal or anything, the more that biology will trust you and the more information you will get. And if you just poke people, you don't get the answer. So watch this twitch. We can make her talking finger go. Uh, can you see that from the back? Now, the more you use the muscle, the more active that twitch is. So people in New York, that finger just flies. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, can, can, come, 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 come back one more. I'm so sorry. So this is the trigger point right here and the set where the muscle and the fascia are bound in a knot. But her injury is up here. This is tender, that's tender, this is tender, that's a little tender, and that's less tender, and that's not. You feel all that? Mm -hmm. So this, all through here, is where her injury is that leads to this. If we were to touch, can I touch your SCM? Sure. So she has a knot in this SCM right here, and her injury is right down here. And that's tender. This is not but that is, millimeter by millimeter. If we look at her hand, from gripping and holding her dental tools, she has a trigger point in here, and the injury is where she attaches right here. That's tender, this is not. Millimeter by millimeter, you can tell somebody's injuries through time by the texture of their fascia, and that's part of what we teach, thank you. <clears throat> Give her a hand. <clears throat> I injured my lower back on the Nautilus machine in the mid-1980s, and I remember reading an orthopedic journal, and they were talking about how to tell when a patient's faking. And I realized this is my fifth day after the injury. I had not had a pain-free moment, and I couldn't do the test that proved that I was faking. And I realized the person who wrote this article had never hurt his back and had no idea what he was talking about. 
And that led to my search of where does it really come from. And I found out trigger point injections helped. Prolotherapy helped, but none of it made it go away. Where were the real injuries that caused the pain in my lower back? They happened when I was a child, and yours also. What did we do as children? We jumped out of trees. We jumped off the swing set. How many of you can remember how many steps you could jump in one jump? Uh huh. And then you either led the other kids, followed the other kids, or watched the other kids jump off the roof. You remember that too, right? What did that injure? Your hip tendons, your glute tendons. That's where back pain comes from. And here's the diagram. We were taught to call this sciatica. I'm going to suggest that sciatica doesn't really exist except in rare circumstance. It's not the disc. It's not the nerve. It's the fascia. And you need to treat where you're tender and you'll watch this go away. Piriformis syndrome doesn't really deserve a name. The most se severe lower back pain comes from the glutes. There was a man who came to me, and um, he was a bodybuilder, 32 years old. He comes to see me, and his history was, three weeks ago I was lifting weights, went out and ran a mile and a half, just like I always do, woke up the next day with this pain in my lower back, numbness in my leg, I've got weakness in the leg, my MRI shows, a herniated disc, free fragment, migrating inferiorly, pushing on nerve. I said, I don't think I can help you. You've got to go have the surgery that's already scheduled for next week. He said, I'm a bodybuilder. There's no way I'm doing the surgery. I hear you're really good with a needle. Would you just poke me? <laughs> he came back in two weeks. 90% of his pain was gone. A couple more visits, all of it went away. He came back 10 years later. Same thing. Same back pain. Did the same treatment. Pain goes away again. I said, um, you have health insurance. Can we get an MRI of your back? I've been wondering for 10 years what happened to that disc. We got another MRI. He now has four herniated discs at four levels and no pain. The disc doesn't necessarily cause the pain. Another example, man comes to me and every patient colors a pain diagram and he colors yellow all the way down the back of his legs and into his feet. He settles his workers' comp claim. He had his lumbar fusion 10 years prior and now he can afford platelet-rich plasma and tendon restoration. That's what I do. I restore people's bodies. And so we did every place he was tender, where he was injured from whatever he did. And he comes back in four weeks and says, since I did what I did, two days after what we did, he could feel his dog lick the bottoms of his feet for the first time in 10 years. I'm going to suggest we don't even know where the numbness and tingling comes from, and it's not the nerve, and it's not the back, and it's not the disc, except sometimes. And that's how often back surgery works, sometimes. So why do we keep doing it most times? Pelvic pain isn't any different. There could be pelvic trauma, but that trauma could also have come from riding your bicycle. And not from the seat, but from what your thighs have to do. And every place where the fascia inserts on the pelvic floor can be injured. And if the pelvic floor has to contract and it can't contract because it can't anchor, then you aggravate the trigger points and you fire up the pain every time you contract it. But that's not where it starts. Pelvic pain starts in the thigh and the adductors. And even interstitial cystitis may not come from your bladder. It can come from your thighs. The reason you can't bend over and touch your toes with your knees straight is because of the inactive or latent trigger points in your hamstring muscles where they're bound and where they're tight. If you release that, you'll watch that go away and get restored. What about phantom limb pain? We um, do a BK amputation. That means below the knee, we take off the rest of the leg. And people come in and go, my foot hurts. And we go, well, there's no foot there, so we call it phantom limb pain. So think about what happens in a BK amputation. You take a saw and you cut the tibia and fibula. You take the gastroc and soleus and tibialis posterior and bring them around and tack them to the front so that you have skin, muscle, and fat to cushion the skin from the bone so your prosthesis doesn't make a hole in your skin. The calf muscle doesn't care that there's no foot there and it still sends pain to the foot. And if you treat the fascia that got injured in the calf, you'll watch the foot pain go away. You think you have plantar fasciitis, but your plantar fasciitis most often does not come from your foot. It comes from your calf. And just when you think you've figured it all out, the world throws you a curve. 
and the muscle in the calf sends pain to the ipsilateral face. If you are treating a TMJ syndrome or you're treating face pain, you can't touch their legs because they'll make movies about you. But your doctor should touch the leg because that can also send the pain to the face. What about treatment? You need to make the knot smaller, you need to strengthen and repair the enthesis, and you need to get rid of the ropey band. We'll talk about that in a little bit. One of the ways to in inactivate trigger points is ischemic compression. I don't know if it's really ischemic compression. You are physically trying to take the kink out of the muscle with pressure from outside. Dry needling works too. Acupuncture needles, physical therapy dry needles, any needle that you want. And most people who are doing trigger point injections put in a local anesthetic. We rarely do that anymore. And some people still use a steroid. There is no place for a steroid in a trigger point injection. And then photon therapy, infrared light, has remarkable healing powers. Why inactivate trigger points? Think about this. Everyone in the room has done stretching at one time in their life. How were you taught to stretch? I'm going to suggest that every stretch you've been taught is pulling on the ends of your strings. If you do this with your head, you're pulling on the ends. You bend over and reach your toes, you're pulling on the ends. You've got a knot in the middle of the shoelace, and they've taught you to do that. And you wonder why it doesn't work. So if you're going to force this muscle to stretch, you get on this end of the rope, and very, very slowly, with a fair amount of pressure, you go like this, and you unkink the strings. And you can't use oil. You have to use skin, because skin is the handle to the strings underneath that you're trying to unkink. And if you don't unkink them, you don't make anything stretch. Legs. How many people have seen those with edema in the leg. And we think that edema or peripheral edema, we need to restrict salt and it's cardiac and on and on. Most often when the leg swells, it's because it needs to be swollen. It's not cardiac. Why would a leg need to be swollen? If you look at the legs that are swollen, the gastroc and soleus are incredibly tight. What's the meaning of that? Well, if you just feel your upper traps, you've got a rope there that's pretty tight. The significance of that rope is that it's going to impede blood flow into the muscle because it requires a push to get through the density of the pressure in the ropey band. So that means that before it should, this muscle is going to start to burn fuel anaerobically. And as soon as you burn fuel anaerobically, you make 32 molecules of lactic acid for every molecule of ATP. And you don't have enough perfusion in that muscle to wash it out. So the fascia and the fibroblast senses the toxicity in the tissue and the ends of the fibroblast unhook and they suck water out of the veins to dilute the toxicity of the tissue. You need to detoxify the legs and you need to detoxify it into the muscle and then after a month of doing that yourself you'll find that the legs aren't so swollen because they don't need to be anymore because you've been able to get the lactic acid and the other metabolic waste out of the muscle. We have this debate about prolotherapy and trigger point injections. Janet Travell taught that the pain at the emphasis is referred from the trigger point, and I think she missed. This is the primary injury. The injury goes all along here, and this is where the fascia has wrapped itself up in a knot. And the nerve endings in between the strings are crushed by that. And the reason I can push on your elbow and find out that it's tender is because these nerve endings in between the strings are not only crushed by the knot, but I added my finger to it, and that makes it tender. And two inches away, why is it less tender? There's no knot there, and no matter how hard I push on that finger, I can't put the same force on these nerve endings. So even two inches away, it's not as tender. Even a millimeter away, it may not be as tender. There are trigger points in the emphasis and trigger points in the muscle belly. So if you don't want to put prolotherapy on your chart, you can call everything a trigger point injection, and you don't have to differentiate it. And I remember a workers' comp dispute, and the lady didn't want to pay my bill. And she said, you can't fool me, Dr. Blattman. You put dextrose and novocaine into that. You're doing prolotherapy, and I authorize trigger point injections. I said, ma'am, I did trigger point injections, not prolotherapy, and I put those things in my needle because I think they work better. We went to court, 
and the hearing officer said, if you can put cortisone into a trigger point, you can put dextrose and novocaine into a trigger point. Case dismissed. It's nice to win one, isn't it? When a trigger point is inactivated, the pain pattern will shift to that of an earlier trigger point, and you will chase the evolution of that pain pattern backwards in time until you make it go poof. If you get the original trigger point that started it, you might shut the whole thing down on the first visit. In 30 years and 10,000 patients, I've done that once. I know what can happen. Janet talked about it. And then I've had patients come in and go, you know, since my last treatment, it hurts in this other place, and it hasn't hurt there since my injury. And I'm going, perfect. That's a great sign. We found where it comes from. We use a rubber ball. Can you um, play the sound on this one? We teach this. It's in my book. We teach this to all of our patients. This video is about how to use this rubber ball to massage your body to relieve shoulder pain, headaches, upper back pain, lower back pain the pain that we call sciatica. Take this ball, put your lower body against the wall, drop it from the top, lean forward, and you can send that ball directly down to about the level of your bra strap. Up and down massages that, limbo massages and puts the ball all the way up to the top in one motion without even having to bend your knees. More important is the shoulder blade, ball right over here. You're going to turn 45 degrees to the wall. You're going to do this rocking motion we call the wiggle dance. Bend down, come back up, cross lightly over the middle, to the other side, turn 45 degrees, massage this one, and then take this ball, drop it down to your butt right about here, same 45 degree position, this kind of massage right on your butt, down, back up, cross lightly over, adjust the ball if you need to, down, back up, and with just that, for a couple minutes before your work shift, you can relieve the tension that causes upper back, shoulder, head and neck pain, lower back and pain down your legs, just with this ball. Just with this ball, you can make most of your pain a whole lot better most of the time. Every patient colors a pain diagram. This is a lady who has all this pain, and she walks around with that all the time. And what did we do? We took platelet-rich plasma, and we treated the tendons and fascia in her neck, shoulder, rotator cuff tendon, hip tendons, and this was a month later. Look how much pain goes away in a month. And then without further treatment, this one is even better than it was a month before. Those platelet-rich plasma injections went into the quadriceps origin, gluteal tendons, levator scapulae, teres and infraspinatus tendons, scalene and suboccipital attachments, and the upper trap attachments. And as her body restored and as her body could anchor, her pain goes away. Numbness, tingling, burning, all of it. So what causes pain? The free nerve endings between the fascia strings and layers that measure pressure and shear force. The tight ropey bands put pressure on the free nerve endings. More pressure leads to more and radiating pain. And you need to reduce the pressure to reduce or eliminate the pain. And it doesn't matter how your brain interprets that. Bladder distension is the same thing. How do you know you have to pee? As your bladder wall distends, it thins. And the shear force of the nerve endings in between interpret that most often not as pain, but I've got to go use the restroom. So here's a diagram of how this happens. The enthesis is over on the right. You have an injury when the enthesis gets injured. These are the nerve endings in between the strings. Here's your primary injury. As the muscle contracts against that injury, the ropey band forms, the trigger point forms, and it starts to fire. All right, so anaerobic metabolism is that ropey band. Lactic acid, inflammatory mediators, and pain radiates along the fascia lines. What do you do with that? We now do our trigger point injections with either ozonated oxygen, pure oxygen, or nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide is really cool. There's a little bit of anesthetic property with it, but as people walk out of the office when they're better, they're really better. It's not because they're numb and their muscles giggle on the way out the door. <laughs> so, as you separate the fascia strings from the inside with your needle and your gas, you re-establish blood flow into the depths of the muscle. You allow the strings to move independently and you restore the anatomy to what it used to be. 
And then you take platelet-rich plasma or stem cells and you repair the enthesis. And if you can get all that to work, you can watch all this go back to normal. And as fast as you can do enough of that, you can watch your pain go away. Can you play this one? I'm here with Randy. Randy has been injured several months ago, and we just did some treatment with trigger point injections. He's um, changed a lot of his food and diet to reduce inflammation in his body, and here's part of his story about his experience today. This is his second visit. I've been suffering for the last six months with major arm pain, uh, pins and needles running up and down my right arm. I've just had two or three injections. Five. And I am pain free right now. It's amazing. And the numbness in your arm? My numbness is I can move my arm. There's no pins and needles. I can move my neck. So we found that before. this pain is not coming from a disc and not coming from nope. a nerve? And nope. Numbness doesn't come from nerve necessarily. Nope. And no one was able to do this for me. Despite Thanks. all the things you've Thanks done up until Yes. All right. Absolutely. This is so, so much fun to get out of pain. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's the way it should really work, and it doesn't matter how many years you have it, it should still respond that way. So we can grow new tendons and we can grow new ligaments. Our body spends a lot of energy ignoring us. You spend a lot of brain power to focus on something, but to focus on that you have to ignore everything else. The part of the pain that you feel is the part you're not able to ignore. All you need, you don't need to be perfect to get better, you need to have it under your radar so it's not in your face anymore. And then your body doesn't have to spend so much energy ignoring it. And what you find is that when you quiet down the tubas, you can hear the clarinets. Your body will most likely not teach you about dairy till you learn the lesson about bread flour. And then after dairy, you'll find out what's next. It kind of works that way. How many people do you see with car accidents and neck injuries and persistent neck pain and persistent neck tightness one of the things that causes that is a tear or stretch of the ligaments that hold these bones together. And watch what happens with the slip on this particular lady. Watch right there where the arrow is, slip and fall off the back there. Want to see that again? Can you see that part move? Right there. So what does the body do to prevent that? Because our body doesn't like an unstable neck. To prevent that slip, our muscles stay tight and we grow spurs on the joints to prevent the slip. How do you restore that? You re-injure the ligament with a needle poke very discreetly where it needs to be and you put in platelet-rich plasma and or stem cells and you restore the integrity of the ligaments that hold you together. And you wear a cervical collar for a few weeks so you don't stretch them out as they're trying to contract and restore you and then your head and neck pain can get a whole lot better. We can grow cartilage in worn out joints. How many people do you see who go, my knee is bone on bone? I'm gonna tell you, if you can straighten your knee and you can bend it this far, there is no possible way that joint is bone on bone no matter what your x-ray looks like. No possible way. With that, I also need to tell you that it only takes two or three cell layers of thickness of cartilage to get a joint to move. And that takes a microscope. So the x-ray is going to look pretty close to bone on bone. But if you can still move, you have enough cartilage to probably restore the joint. And the pain might not be coming from the joint. And the best proof of that is how many people do you know who have had their joint replaced and the knee still hurts and there's no knee there? So. The orthopedic texts say that you're born with cartilage, you use it up with time, and then you're done, you get a new joint. Does that make any sense? We grow new intestinal lining every three days. We grow new skin every week and a half. We grow brain cells, we grow bone cells. Does it make any sense that we don't grow cartilage to repair from daily wear and tear? And the answer is we grow cartilage in every single joint, every minute of every day, unless one of two things happens. Nicotine in your blood, or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. When you take an Advil for your pain, you interrupt your healing, you cause ulcers, you cause kidney failure, and you cause heart attacks. I had a patient come in and she said, my orthopedic surgeon prescribed meloxicam, should I take it? And I said, I wouldn't. 
and said, you take that drug, it's going to stop your body from healing, it's going to keep you from growing cartilage in the joint from wear and tear, it's going to cause kidney failure if you're susceptible, and then heart attacks. Even a few Advil a day is enough to cause a heart attack. She said, oh, what should I tell my doctor? I said, how much fun do you want to have? I said, I think if you really want to have fun, you go into the doctor and you tell him you're not taking the medicine. And if he really cares, he'll ask you why. And you tell him all four of those things, and at the end of that say, I think taking that drug is dumbass. <laughs> I'm willing to pay your copay just to hear what he has to say. <laughs> so this cartilage can be restored. And the knee can be restored. And yeah, that's not bone on bone, but this patient came to me and told me her doctor said this was bone on bone, and that's not even close. There's still joint space there. So 20 years ago, I walked off the tennis court. I couldn't even take two steps to hit the ball, and my kid goes, Dad, two steps. And I said, I'm done. My knees can't move. If it's not within one step, it's yours. I'm glad you've got wheels. And I learned about glucosamine hydrochloride that same week. Not sulfate. Not chondroitin, glucosamine hydrochloride. And a month later, I was scratching my head, wondering if I was any better. And two months later, I was back on the court. And six months later, I was pain-free. Now we use glucosamine cream as well as capsules. We use the sulfate more. You don't need the chondroitin. Glucosamine by mouth works for knees. If you have knee pain and you're taking glucosamine and you're not getting better, it's either not your issue or your glucosamine doesn't work. And any study you read that says glucosamine doesn't work for knees, they used a glucosamine that didn't work. You need to find one that does. And if you want to use glucosamine on any other joint, jaw joint especially, it goes by cream through skin, and you can rehabilitate a jaw joint. With glucosamine injected, we do inject glucosamine. With glucosamine topically, and why is topically important? Because if you're going to restore a joint, two things need to happen. You need to slow down wear and tear, and you need to speed up repair. And speeding up repair is all about getting the nutrients into the body to assist that, and glucosamine is key to that. And slowing down your wear and tear means you take the elevator and the escalator and save your knees for the tennis court and skiing and the other things that you really want to do, because it won't do all of it. Platelet-rich plasma. If you have a rotator cuff tear, that means you started out with a tendon that looks like this, and now you've got some version of different. The orthopedic surgeon is going to cut this, cut back far enough to get to a reasonably healthy compromise, and then drag this over and anchor it to the bone. And then you go to physical therapy to undo some of that. Meanwhile, back in Wayne Manor, do you remember skinning your knee, you grow a scab, four weeks later the scab falls off, and you have new skin underneath. How often does that work? Every time, right? or you wouldn't be here. Well, if I take blood out of your arm and concentrate the parts that would grow that scab, create a new injury with my needle pokes into this tendon, and put that stuff in, in four weeks when the scab falls out, you have new strings holding you together, and you didn't need that rotator cuff surgery. And your rehab is way easier. You don't have to go through the physical therapy either. So these are the fractions. You can also change skin. If you create an injury in the skin with microneedling, you can watch the skin contract. This is four months. You can do that to face. You can do that to belly and stretch marks. You can do that almost anywhere. Some people like their hands done. Some people like the tops of their thighs done. Where can we get stem cells? We have a few places. We can do a, mod, a, a mild liposuction and pull them from belly fat. We can harvest them out of the bone marrow in your pelvis. Or we can get them from placenta umbilical cord, um, and that's much better because it doesn't traumatize your body, and those cells are much, much younger and much more active. Here's a picture of a liposuction. It's just liposuction into a syringe. So the treatment of the future is here today with platelet-rich plasma, stem cells, nutrition, repairing worn cartilage, urinary stress incontinence, erectile dysfunction, heart failure, COPD, emphysema, Parkinson's, all kinds of things we can use this for. Stem cells are actually the engine of regeneration. They're programmed to do their job, to die, and to be replaced. 
They have two characteristics. They can decide what to become, and they're able to duplicate. And what we use is mesenchymal stem cells, and they don't really turn into anything in your body. If we take stem cells from a baby and we put them into you, it's not an embryo. It's a live, healthy birth, live, healthy mother. Things are tested. Baby's tested, passes all the tests, then it gets cryopreserved, and we can order it up and put it into you. And they, they signal to your body. They're actually mesenchymal signaling cells. Um, that's to stress that there's nothing embryonic. So we use a fraction of placenta, umbilical cord cells, and umbilical cord tissue with controlled quality and quantity. An adult stem cell out of your body in 30 days might grow into 200. A cord stem cell will grow way, way more. And stem cells with age, with age your stem cell numbers go down and they lose their functional potency. If a baby is at 100% of function, a 60-year-old is at 5% of that. You want to use a baby's stem cells. You don't want to use yours. What do they do? When your body needs to repair, it sets up signal flares, and the stem cells that leak out of your bone marrow go to those places and help facilitate the repair. Same thing happens if we use stem cells intravenously. They're going to go all over your body and attach to the blood vessels nearby where your body is signaling for help. And then they release a magical soup and help your body heal and help your body regenerate. They don't turn into anything, as best as we know. They can also reduce inflammatory changes. You can actually make rheumatoid arthritis go away. You can change Crohn's disease. Most diseases have systemic inflammation as a common denominator. We hear that all the time, and we've heard that several times in this meeting. The MSCs can reduce inflammatory markers by 50% within 48 hours of the first dose. And then you can follow it up with a second dose a month or two months later. We have used this for rheumatoid arthritis, irritable bowel, MS, lupus, type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes. I have a type 2 diabetic who's controlled by diet with his blood sugars at 140, and a month after his stem cells, they're at 90. Asthma, lungs, COPD, you might be able to get off your oxygen tank. You can stimulate regeneration, tissue turnover and replacement for arthritis, cellular tissue, and organ tissue. What about reactions? The stem cells from babies are considered immune privileged. They're donor friendly. There's no graft versus host reaction that we know of. Your body won't reject them. They're tumorocidal. They're more likely to kill a tumor than they are to cause one. This is just a summary of the various diseases or problems where this is um, being used. These are the blood sugars of that patient, and he actually tracked himself and saw just overnight, as things got active, his pancreas changed. You can use them to restore sexual parts. You can put them in a penis, a vagina, a clitoris. You can reduce urinary stress incontinence. I have a patient, and sometimes things happen that are inadvertent, like a patient came in and said, my eyeball pressures and my glaucoma have gone from 16 down to 12. We didn't really expect that. And then we also use ozonated oxygen. And a lot of you in this room use it. We do major autohemotherapy. Our cells don't function at the high level we need as we age, as we're exposed to stress, and as we get mitochondrial dysfunctions and disorders and you can actually restore the mitochondrial function, and we do that quite a bit. You can enhance the immune system, and so we do this for all of these various diseases, including uh, Lyme disease. And we, if you're not familiar with the procedure, we start an IV, we drain your blood into a bag that has 100 cc's of saline in it, and then we ozonate the bag, and then we turn that bright red, and we hang it up and put it into you, and that's what it looks like when it's bright red. You never want to see that color outside your body coming from you unless it's contained in a bag, right? So in November, we're going to teach a course for dentists about head and neck pain, teach you how to touch, teach you how to feel, teach you how to know where somebody's injuries are by the texture of their fascia, and then show you what to do with it to help get the pain to go away. We'll be talking about ozone, nitrous oxide, this is hands-on. You'll be putting needles into each other, 
You'll be using all these tricks in the trade. It promises to be a lot of fun. We've done this course many times. It's the Friday and Saturday, 16th and 17th, I think, of November, unless it's the 15th and 16th, but it is that Friday, Saturday. 16th? Thank you. If you want to refer people to me, I have a, I'm in New York City about once a month. I go to Seattle two or three times a year. I've been very fortunate to be able to teach the medical students at Bastyr when I'm there, and that's been a lot of fun. We do all our scheduling through uh, the Cincinnati office. And thank you very much. We have time for questions. How do you, thank you for a great lecture. This is really eye-opening. Thank Blackman. you. Um, so the Lyme patients, these are patients that are all devastated for a long time. Many of them suffer the consequences of the medical care they received. So how does what you do, like do you do the IV? The IV uh, MAHs. The part, and how does that help with their chronic pain and trigger point and fatigue issues? If, the, if your biology can function at a higher level and your mitochondria work a little bit better, you can restore your muscles faster than otherwise, and you can restore your energy. You also, with the MAH, can put some calcium in an increased complement, and so that enhances the immune system's function to perhaps kill the Lyme disease, not to mention your white blood cells now have mitochondria that work at a higher level. So we've seen some really interesting things with Lyme disease. This is the part of Lyme disease that I do. I don't do the antibiotics, so I'm not the only person involved in their care most of the time. Thank you. Um, I've looked a lot into the stem cells, and being an old infectious disease doctor, I worry about these babies aren't that well screened. Uh, retroviruses, you know, they found, they found retroviruses in polio vaccine. Uh, 20 years later, people got lymphoma. And I just, when I look at these various companies, the controls are very superficial. You know, hepatitis A, B, and C, some very common things, but not there aren't good tests for retroviruses. I, I just, I worry about that. Do you, does that, do you consider it or you just? I consider hope? it and I don't dispute it at all because, you know, we found out about hepatitis C the hard way, right? And so you can't imagine, you can imagine that there can be things there that we can't test for and don't know about yet. And I totally agree. We've not seen an issue with that. We've not seen a problem with that. I've had a couple doses myself. Maybe I'll turn out in 10 years to think it was a bad idea, but there are people all over the country that are doing such amazing healing and get their bodies restored and their lives back, which is so empowering that I'm willing to take the risk on that myself. Thank you. I, I'm a uh, long distance, been a long distance runner, marathoner my entire life, and. I was uh, interested in the glucosamine chondroitin information that you had. Uh, is there a glucosamine supplement that you would recommend? Am I allowed to mention product names in the talk? Or, or yes. Yeah. I use the glucosamine sulfate from Thorn. It's simple, it's easy, it's pretty clean. Uh, 500 milligrams three times a day has worked in so many people over the last 20 years. Okay, and that's from Thorn? Thorn, T H O R N E. e. Just a plain glucosamine sulfate. And then the glucosamine cream is compounded by my friendly neighborhood compounding pharmacist. And one other question about collagen. It's my wife's question, but a <laughs> uh, question about collagen. Is there a collagen supplement or um, something to help with uh, regeneration? Um, there, one of our speakers from, from yesterday has a collagen product, I think. He knows way more about the collagen than I do. Patients with connective tissue weakness, like Ehlers-Danlos disease? Yes. Do you have a pro protocol or program to help them? Same thing as all the rest. You go after the enthesis, you go after the muscle, you help the fascia heal. But they have a, a problem, their fascia is gonna break down again. 
it's still the best thing for them, but they don't hold it as long as you or I would, and they may need to have it repeated more often than you or I would because they get injured more easily. Grafting, you say? Did you say grafting? No. The, the, needle, the needle surgery that we do with oh, the... Oh, okay, I got it, got it. So okay. we'll get the fascia to repair, right. but it's not, yeah. it's not normal fascia, so it doesn't hold together as well as we'd like.